What is the scariest true story you have ever heard? Welcome to our YouTube channel. Join us as we delve into the darkest realms of human mystery and intrigue. Brace yourselves for the most chilling and enigmatic true crime stories that will keep you on the edge of your seats. After waking up, Peter Porco carried out his morning routine. He had written a check for his son Christopher, made a packed lunch, and attempted to load the dishwasher in the kitchen. This all might seem normal, but in this case it was far from it. Peter Porco had just been assaulted with an axe while he laid in bed, being hit 16 times and opening his skull. His wife Joan, who laid in the bed beside him was also assaulted with the same axe and was severely disfigured by the attack. With a severed head injury Peter got up and continued his day as normal. He even went to the toilet and washed his face. Even the sight of a bloody sink wasn't enough to bring him to his senses. Peter left pools of blood all over the house as he continued his normal routine. He even got locked out of the house when he went to collect the morning newspaper and still had the wits to find the hidden spare key. On November 15, 2004, law clerk Peter Porco, 52, didn't show up for work, so his colleague Michael Hart stopped by his house on Broccoli Drive to check on him. Peering in the front door window, Hart saw Peter's body sprawled on the floor amid a huge amount of blood. The authorities would later determine Porco had been struck with an axe 16 times. Apparent burglary. The police found Joan Porco, 54, in the bedroom. Like her husband, she had been hit with an axe, but only three times. The assault had broken her jaw, destroyed one of her eyes, and penetrated her skull deeply enough to expose her brain. But she was alive and conscious. Before paramedics took her to the hospital, Detective Christopher Bodish questioned her about the attacker. In the presence of Bodish as well as paramedics on the scene, she nodded yes when asked whether it was her younger son. Police found that someone had smashed the house's burglar alarm, snipped the phone line, and opened a window and cut a hole in the screen. A newspaper reporter first informed Chris Porco about the murder, and he rushed home from Rochester to see his mother in Albany Medical Center, where she had undergone 12 hours of surgery. He told police he was sleeping in the lounge of his dormitory, Monroe House, during the time of the attacks. Mob Link Investigators had a few leads on other suspects. One, an unhappy litigant in a custody case, had vowed revenge against Peter. But the man had a good alibi. A newspaper reporter first informed Chris Porco about the murder and he rushed home from Rochester to see his mother in Albany Medical Center, where she had undergone 12 hours of surgery. He told police he was sleeping in the lounge of his dormitory, Monroe House, during the time of the attacks. There was also a theory involving organized crime. Perhaps a former loan shark named Frank. Frankie the fireman, Porco, a great uncle of Peter's, had been considering ratting out his mob associates and they killed Peter as a warning not to. But Frankie was in jail specifically because he refused to cooperate, so that theory evaporated. Investigators discovered more compelling evidence against Christopher Porco. For one, someone had burglarized the Porco's house in 2002 and 2003, and Christopher was the number one suspect. He used eBay to sell computer equipment stolen from his parents, and a veterinary hospital where he worked part-time. Surveillance Cameras Investigators found surveillance video of a yellow jeep that supported their contention that Christopher traveled 232 miles from Rochester to the Porco's house the night of the attack, assaulted his mother and father with an axe, and hightailed it back to Rochester. Police couldn't find any New York State Thruway Easy Pass data on the yellow jeep but toll booth attendants at the cash-only lane said they thought they remembered seeing the car with Christopher in the driver's seat. 
the video evidence came from the university. It had footage of the yellow jeep leaving and returning to campus at an interval that fit a realistic timeline for commission of the crime. 10.30 p.m. jeep left Rochester campus. 2.14 a.m. burglar alarm deactivated at parents' home. 4.59 a.m. phone line cut. 8.30 a.m. jeep returned to campus. Police believe Christopher cut the hole in the window to make it look like a burglary. Nothing was stolen from the house. Windfall expected. Jonathan Porco, an officer in the U.S. Navy, said that his brother was one of a handful of people who knew the alarm's four-digit deactivation code. Christopher smashed the alarm box in a failed attempt to mask the fact that someone had punched the correct code in, investigators theorized. There was more. Christopher had sought financial advice shortly before the axe attack. He told an investment professional he was coming into some money, investigators discovered. And of course, they found the evidence about those loans that Christopher had taken out fraudulently, using his parents as co-signers without their knowledge. Investigators also thought Christopher chose an axe as his weapon in the belief it would divert all suspicion to his mob-involved relative, Frankie the Fireman. But he's no help. The trial took place in July of 2006 with Chief Assistant District Attorney Michael P. McDermott leading the prosecution and lawyers Terence Kynlon and Lori Shanks defending the accused. The prosecution had no forensic evidence, except for a New York throughway ticket that allegedly carried Christopher's mitochondrial DNA. Investigators theorized he wore scrubs from the veterinary office during the assault and then destroyed or hid them. A colleague testified that Christopher had experience cleaning up after surgical procedures. Nine of Christopher's fraternity brothers refuted his story that he was asleep in the lounge at Rochester. And a neighbor driving by the Porco's house claimed he glimpsed the jeep in the driveway on the night of the attacks. Still, there were no eyewitnesses placing Christopher directly at the crime scene inside the house. Here's the heartbreaking aspect of the trial. Joan Porco stood by her son through everything. She accompanied him to court and testified for the defense. Mother's love. She told the jury she didn't recall implicating Christopher the night of the attack and that her child would never commit a heinous crime like the one that killed her husband and disfigured her. She maintained that while Christopher's financial misdeeds angered her and Peter, they all loved one another and wanted to work on their relationship. In fact, after Christopher's 2005 indictment for second-degree murder and attempted murder, Joan had scraped together $250,000 for his bail. The two walked to court with their arms linked. None of that helped. A jury quickly convicted Christopher on the strength of the timeline the prosecution constructed. He got 50 years to life and is at the Clinton Correction Facility in Danamora, New York. If you happen to have enjoyed the video, kindly pay the like button a visit. Do not forget to subscribe and hit on the notification bell for more videos.